Introduction of the Red and the Black, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sandra Luna. The Red and the Black, Volume 1, by Stendhal. Translated by Horace B. Samuel. Introduction. Some slight sketch of the life and character of Stendhal is particularly necessary to an understanding of Le Rouge et le Noir, the Red and the Black, not so much as being the formal stuffing of which introductions are made, but because the book, as a book, stands in the most intimate relation to the author's life and character. The hero, Julien, is no doubt viewed superficially, a cad, a scoundrel, an assassin, albeit a person who will alternate the moist eye of the sentimentalist with the ferocious grin of the beast of prey. But Stendhal, so far from putting forward any excuses, makes a specific point of wallowing defiantly in his own alleged wickedness. Even assuming that Julien is a villain, and that it is my portrait, he wrote shortly after the publication of the book, why quarrel with me? In the time of the emperor, Julien would have passed for a very honest man. I lived in the time of the emperor. So, but what does it matter? Henri Ville was born in 1783 in Grenoble, in Dauphiny, the son of a royalist lawyer, situated on the borderland between the gentry and that bourgeoisie which our author was subsequently to chastise with that malice peculiar to those who spring themselves from the class which they despise. The boy's character was a compound of sensibility and hard rebelliousness, virility and introspection, orphaned of his mother at the age of seven, hated by his father and unpopular with his schoolmates. He spent the orthodox, unhappy childhood of the artistic temperament. Winning a scholarship at the École Polytechnique at the age of sixteen, he proceeded to Paris, where, with characteristic independence, he refused to attend the college classes and set himself to study privately in his solitary rooms. In 1800, the influence of his relative, M. Daru, procured him a commission with the French army, and the Marengo campaign gave him an opportunity of practicing that Napoleonic worship to which, throughout his life, he remained consistently faithful, for the operation of the philosophical materialism of the French skeptics on an essentially logical and mathematical mind soon swept away all competing claimants for his religious adoration. Almost from childhood, moreover, he had abominated the Jesuits, and papism is the source of all crimes was throughout his life one of his favorite maxims after the army's triumphant entry into milan bill returned to grenoble on furlough whence he dashed off to paris in pursuit of a young woman to whom he was paying some attention resigned his commission in the army and set himself to study with the view of becoming a great man it is in this period that we find the most marked development in Beale's enthusiasm of psychology. This tendency sprang primarily, no doubt, from his own introspection, for throughout his life Beale enjoyed the indisputable and at times dubious luxury of a double consciousness. He invariably carried inside his brain a psychological mirror which reflected every phrase of his emotion with scientific accuracy and, simultaneously, the critical spirit, half-genie, half-demon inside his brain, would survey, in the semi-detached mood of a keenly interested spectator, the actual emotion itself, applaud or condemn it, as the case might be, and ticket the verdict with ample commentations in the psychological register of its own analysis. But this trend to psychology, while, as we have seen to some extent, the natural development of mere self-analysis was also tinged with the spirit of self-preservation. With a mind, which in spite of its natural physical courage was morbidly susceptible to ridicule and was only too frequently the dupe of the fear of being duped, Stendhal would scent an enemy in every friend, and as a mere matter of self-protection 
set himself to penetrate the secret of every character with which he came into contact one is also justified in taking into account an honest intellectual enthusiasm which found its vent in deciphering the rarer and more precious manuscripts of the human document with the exception of a stay in marseilles with his first mistress melanie Rouillère, a charming actress who had the most refined sentiments and to whom i never gave a sou and a subsequent sojourn in grenoble Stendhal remained in paris till eighteen o six living so far as was permitted by the modest allowance of his niggard father the full life of the literary temperament the essence however of his character was that he was at the same time a man of imagination and a man of action we consequently find him serving in the napoleonic campaigns of eighteen o six eighteen o nine and eighteen twelve he was present at the battle of jena came several times into personal contact with napoleon discharged with singular efficiency the administration of the state of brunswick and retained his sang-froid and his bravery during the whole of the panic-stricken retreat of the moscow campaign it is moreover to this period that we date stendhal's liaison with madame Daru, the wife of his aged relative monsieur Daru. This particular intrigue has, moreover, a certain psychological importance in that Madame Daru constituted the model on whom Mathilde de la Mole was drawn in the red and the black. The student and historian, consequently, who is anxious to check how far the novelist is drawing on his experience and how far on his imagination, can compare with profit the description of the Mathilde episode in the red and the black with those sections in Stendhal's journal entitled The Life and Sentiments of Silentious Harry, Memoirs of My Life During My Amour with Countess Palfy, and also with the posthumous fragment Le Consultation de Banti, a piece of methodical deliberation on the pressing question Dois-je ou ne dois-je pas avoir la duchesse? written with all the documentary coldness of a government report it is characteristic that both Pansy and julien decide in the affirmative as a matter of abstract principle for they both feel that they must necessarily reproach themselves in after life if they miss so signal an opportunity disgusted by the restoration stendhal migrated in eighteen fourteen to milan his favourite town in europe whose rich and varied life he savoured to the full from the celebrated ices in the entreats of the opera to the reciprocated interest of madame angelina pietragora the duchesse de sanserina of the chartreuse of parma a sublime wanton a la lucrezia borgia who would appear to have deceived him systematically it was in milan that stendhal first began to write for publication producing in eighteen fourteen the lives of haydn and mozart and in eighteen seventeen a series of travel sketches rome naples florence which was published in london it was in milan also that stendhal first nursed the abstract thrills of his grand passion for mathilde countess don bosca whose angelic sweetness would seem to have served at any rate to some extent as a prototype to the character of madame de renal in eighteen twenty one the novelist was expelled from milan on the apparently unfounded accusation of being a french spy it is typical of that mixture of brutal sensuality and rarefied sentimentalism which is one of the most fascinating features of stendhal's character that even though he had never loved more than the lady's heart he should have remained for three years faithful to this mistress of his ideal in eighteen twenty two Stendhal published his treatise de l'amour a practical scientific treatise on the erotic emotion by an author who possessed the unusual advantage of being at the same time an acute psychologist and a brilliant man of the world who could test abstract theories by concrete practice and could coordinate what he had felt in himself and observe in others into broad general principles in eighteen twenty five Stendhal, plunging vigorously into the controversy between the classicists and the romanticists, published his celebrated pamphlet, 
Racine and Shakespeare, in which he vindicated with successful crispness the claims of live verse against stereotyped couplets and of modern analysis against historical tradition. His next work was The Life of Rossini, whom he had known personally in Milan, while in 1827 he published his first novel, Harmonce, which, while not equal to the author's greatest work, give nonetheless good promise of that analytical dash which he was subsequently to manifest. After Armand came the well-known Promenade Rome, while the Stendhalian masterpiece Le Rouge et le Noir was presented in 1830 to an unappreciative public. Enthusiasm for this book is the infallible test of your true Stendhalian. Some critics may prefer, possibly, the more Jamesian delicacy of Armand's, and others, fortified by the example of Goethe, may avow their predilection for the Chartreuse de Parme, with all the Jean Premier charm of its amiable hero. But in our view, no book by Stendhal is capable of giving the reader such intellectual thrills as that work which has been adjudged to be his greatest by Balzac, by Taine, by Bourget. Certainly no other book by Stendhal than that which has conjured up rougistes in all countries in Europe has been the object of a cult in itself. We doubt, moreover, if there is any other modern book, whether by Stendhal or any one else, which has actually been learned by heart by its devotees, who, if we may borrow the story told by M. Paul Bourget, are accustomed to challenge the authenticity of each other's knowledge by starting off with some random passage, only to find it immediately taken up, as though the book had been the very Bible itself. The more personal appeal of what is perhaps the greatest romance of the intellect ever written lies in the character of Julien, its villain hero. In view of the identification of Julien with Stendhal himself, to which we have already alluded, it is only fair to state that Stendhal does not appear to have been a tutor in any bourgeois family, nor does history relate his ever having made any attempt at the homicide of a woman. So far, in fact, as what we may call the external physical basis of the story is concerned, the material is supplied not by the life of the author, but by the life of a young student of Besançon, of the name of Berthet, who dully expiated on the threshold that crime which supplied the plot of this immortal novel. But the soul, the brain of Julien, is not worth it, but Bill, and what indeed is the whole book, if not a vindication of Bailisme, if you may use the word, coined by the man himself for his own outlook on life? For the procedure of Stendhal would seem to have placed his own self in his hero's shoes, to have lived in imagination his whole life, and to have recorded his experience with a wealth of analytic detail which, in spite of some arrogance, is yet both honest and scientific. In the life of this scoundrel, this ingrate, this assassin, certainly seems to have been eminently worth living. In its line, indeed, it constitutes a veritable triumph of idealism, a positive monument of self-help, for judged by the code of the revolution, when the career was open to talents, the goodness or badness of a man, was determined by the use he made of his opportunities. Efficiency was the supreme test of virtue, as was failure the one brand of unworthiness. And measured by these values, Julien ranks high as an ethical saint. For does he not sacrifice everything to the forgiving of his character and the hammering out of his career? He is by nature nervous. He forces himself to be courageous, fighting a duel or capturing a woman, less out of thirst for blood or hunger for flesh than because he thinks it due to his own parvenu self-respect to give himself some concrete proof of his own moral force. Pose and affection will sneer those enemies whom you will have today as assuredly as he had them in his lifetime, the smug bourgeois and valenot of our present age. But the spirit of Julien will retort. I made myself master of my affectation, and I succeeded in my pose. And will he not have logic on his side? For what after all is pose but the pursuit of a subjective ideal, grotesque no doubt in failure, but dignified by its success? 
and as m gautier has shown in his book on bovaris is not all human progress simply the deliberate change from what one is into what one is not yet but what nevertheless one has a tendency to be viewed from this standpoint julien's character is what one feels justified in calling a bona fide pose for speaking broadly his character is twofold half sensitive tenderness half ferocious ambition and his pose simply consists in the subordination of his softer qualities for the more effective realization of his harder considered on these lines le rouge et le noir stands preeminent in european literature as a tragedy of energy and ambition the epic for the struggle for existence the modern bible of nietzschean self-discipline and from the sheer romantic aspect also the book has its own peculiar charm how truly poetic for instance are the passages where julien takes his own mind alone into the mountains plots out his own fate and symbolizes his own solitary life in the lonely circling of a predatory hawk julien's enemies will no doubt taunt him with his introspection while they point to a character distorted so they say by the eternal mirror of its own consciousness yet it should be remembered that julien lived in an age when introspection had so as to speak been only recently invented and byronism and wertherism were the stock food of artistic temperaments in the case of julien moreover even though his own criticism on his own acts were to some extent as important to him as the actual acts themselves his introspection was more a strength than a weakness and never blunted the edge of his drastic action compare for instance the character of julien with the character of robert Dreslow, the hero of bourget's le discipline and the nearest analogue to julien in fond de siècle literature and one will appreciate at once the difference between health and decadence virility and hysteria one of the most essential features of the book however is the swing of the pendulum between julien's ambition and julien's tenderness for our hunter is quite frequently caught in his own traps so that he falls generally in love with a woman who as a matter of abstract principle he had specifically set himself to conquer the book consequently as a romance of love ranks almost as high as it does as a romance of ambition the final ideal in prison with madame de renal in particular is one of the sweetest and purest in literature painted in colours too true ever to be florid steeped in a sentiment too deep ever to be mawkish as moreover orthodox and suburban minds tend to regard all french novels as specifically devoted to obscene wallowings it seems only relevant to mention that stendhal at any rate never finds in sensualism any inspiration for ecstatic rhapsodies and that he narrates the most specific episodes in the chastest style imaginable though too the sinister figure of the carpenter's son looms large over the book the characterization of all other personages is portrayed with consummate brilliancy for stendhal standing first outside his characters with all the sceptical scrutiny of a detached observer then goes deep inside them so that he describes not merely what they do but why they do it not merely what they think but why they think it while he assigns their respective share to innate disposition accident and environment and criticizes his creations with an irony that is only occasionally benevolent for it must be confessed that stendhal approves of extremely few people true scion of the middle classes he hates the bourgeois because he is bourgeois and the aristocrat because he is aristocrat nevertheless as a gallery of the most varied characters patricians and plebeians prudes and profligates jesuits and chainsonists kings and coachmen bishops and bourgeois whose mutual difference act as the most effective foil to each other's reality the rouge et le noir will beat any novel outside balzac we would mention in particular those two contrasted figures madame de renal the bourgeoise passionnée and mathilde de la mole the noble damoiselle who enters into her intrigue 
out of a deliberate wish to emulate the exploits of a romantic ancestress but after all these individuals stand out not so much because their characterization is better than that of their fellow personages but because it is more elaborate even such minor characters for instance as the frilaire the lascivious jesuit noirot the avaricious gallower madame de Ferracu, the amoristic prude are all in their respective ways real vivid convincing no mere padded figures of the imagination but observed actualities swung from the lived life of the written page the style of Stendhal is noticeable from its simplicity clear and cold devoid of all literary artifice characteristic of his analytical purpose he is strenuous in his avoidance of affection though however he never holds out his style as an aesthetic delight in itself he reaches occasionally passages of a rare and simple beauty we would refer in particular to the description of julien in the mountains which we have already mentioned and to the short but impressive death scene his habit however of using language as a means and never as an end occasionally revenges itself upon him in places where the style though intelligible is none the less slovenly anachlusic almost thacidia after the publication of le rouge et le noir stendhal was forced by his financial embarrassment to leave paris and take up the post of consul at trieste driven from this position by the intrigues of a vindictive church he was transferred to civita vecchia where he remained till eighteen thirty five solacing his ennui by the compilation of his autobiography and thinking seriously of marriage with a rich and highly respectable daughter of his laundress he then returned to paris where he remained till eighteen forty two where he died suddenly at the age of fifty-nine in the full swing of all his mental and physical activities his later works include la chartreuse de parme lucien Liouin, and lamiel of which the chartreuse is the most celebrated but lamiel certainly the most sprightly but it is on le rouge et le noir that his fame as a novelist is the most firmly based it is with this most personal document this record of his experiences and emotions that he lives identified just as d'annunzio will live identified with il fuoco or mr wells with the new machiavelli le rouge et le noir is the greatest novel of its age and one of the greatest novels of the whole nineteenth century it is full of the brim of intellect and adventure introspection and action youth romance tenderness cynicism and rebellion it is in a word the intellectual quintessence of the napoleonic era horace b samuel temple october nineteen thirteen end of introduction Recording by Sandra Luna